Hi class, uh, welcome uh, to the interpersonal communications video. Um, I will be now. I am back from Mexico. I am actually from my room, my my house. So I'm going to say this right now. I don't see them around here anywhere, but I have two cats, and both of them are very vocal. One's more vocal than the other. I have Elmo and Chip. Chip will come up and try to just kind of snuggle, uh, and Elmo will like he's really vocal. Um, he's got great interpersonal communication. Um, so I'm going to ignore them if this if that happens. So I just want to give you guys a heads up that it might happen. Um, so today my reading for you guys is going to be in uh, Models of Interpersonal Communication. And our, our author today is Robert M. Krauss, great sociologist um, from back east. And um, he really tried to model uh, communication instead of trying to, to, to define it. And his premise for doing this is that everybody tries to define communication and therefore inter interpersonal communication style. But what happens is you just it means different things to different people. Um, in fact, that's a quote from his uh, from his works. Uh, communication means so many different things in different disciplines. Cellular biology, for example, looks at how cells communicate with each other um, on a chemical basis. Uh, or in enzyme basis too. So um, that's communication. Uh, so defining it as a chemical or enz enzymatic exchange would be massively limiting if you're talking about how people communicate, right? So communication is, um, you know, the exchange of information, but still, it's still, there's also more than just information. The exchange of feelings, um, I mean, it's just so hard to define. Um, anthropology um, defines it within a cultural context, and, and to, many, to many people that's very limiting too. Um, so this isn't a good thing. Um, there's a sociologist, uh, um, Max Thomas um, uh, who, and Luckman, uh, and they observe that communication has come to mean all things to all people. So like I said, it's, uh, you know, what, what Krauss then is used that premise that we have a problem here defining it and said, what, what if we don't try to define it? What if we try to to capture it in modalities, uh, which is something that that hard science hard science does, uh, you know, physics and chemistry and stuff. They 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 use models. Um, physics use models. Phys, phys, uh, um, physics uh, professors and 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 researchers um, they use models um, of functionality all the time to try to explain theories. Um, so that's exactly what Krauss did. Um, so he would then. Instead of trying to define it in, in a succinct term, he came up with three modalities. And there's really two, but encoding modality, decoding model, and then um, uh, the intentionalist model. Uh, so those are three. So the intentionalist model, the decoding model, and the encoding model. <clears throat> and the encoding and decoding models are kind of what you think they would be, but, but let's start with those. They're, they're kind of what you think they would be, but there's kind of more to them as well. All encoding. This is what the encoding and decoding model says. All communication carries with it messages within the message. Very simple, um, but yet not. And in, in some ways, one way of communicating is coding, and then obviously, then you'd have to decode these hidden messages. Emphasis on speech, nonverbal communication, pacing, timing, tonality. Um, all of these things are considered um, when interacting with each other. So, um, you know, even even how I'm communicating right now, the way I'm pacing, um, I'm going a little bit fast. You can tell I'm trying to, you could probably decode that and say, I just trying to make this 10 minute, whatever. It has with it some kind of an underlying feeling and, in, and also it carries um, some uh, other types of auxiliary communicative properties. So that's that's kind of what Krauss was getting at with that. Um, that we we don't just use words; we encode things and decode them um, uh, very dramatically. Um, <coughs> so consider this passage um, about encoding and decoding. Uh, it gets very complicated. Now I, I'm, I'm going to read this. I, I'm going to read this straight from Krauss. Um, Krauss is reading that he's famous published published works. Um, but this kind of a help explain and give an example of encoding and decoding a little bit more specifically. This is Krauss. Men seem to place their voices in a lower part of their vocal range, and women do not, which incidentally helps explain why a man's size can be accurately predicted from his voice 
more than a woman's. So the size of a man's body. And he, he, he uh, references Gradle and Swan 1983. So that's his writing, but he's referencing that, which is what we do in academia. In addition, a speaker's pitch and amplitude can be influenced by the pitch and amplitude, amplitude of the conversational partner. Gregory Lieberman and Natalie, 1975. In other words, what he's saying there is, well, what the researchers are saying, the social psychologists are saying that if you're exchanging information with somebody, if it's somebody that you are trying to cooperate with or that you have good uh, intentions with, um, you will match the pitch of their voice to the best of your abilities. It's a human mannerism. Now, though, the, so that communication goes beyond words. If somebody is not happy with you or does not agree or is having a hard time with what's going on, they'll purposely try to be dissonant with your pitch tone. And we, we intuitively know this and we can see how people are behaving with us. One of the, one of the ways we rank that is by, with this um, coded um, type of, um, of, of, of communication uh, where it's like I'm lower than you or I'm, I'm to prove dominance or I'm higher than you to, to say that I'm more angry or whatever. And different cultures have this in a different way, uh, but it's, it's pretty universal in, in Western culture. In a similar fashion, here's where we get a, another cultural example, a speaker's internal state can induce changes in voice quality, but the relationships is hardly one for one. For example, stress profoundly affects voice fundamental frequency, but in any specific instance, the effect can vary considerably depending on the conversational partner. Let me translate that for you, and that's from Streeter et al., 1983. What he's talking about there is that... Um, you uh, you can when people um, are become, are getting stressful situations, some cultures become more reserved and the frequency of communication drops. And some cultures and people uh, within those cultures, um, you know, become more effusive. Um, so there's cultural distinctions also to be to be had in that. Um, you can consider a lot of Southeast Asian Japanese culture, for example, anthropologically. Um, one of the generalizations of behavioral um, mechanisms is that if something's not going well and stress levels rise, the frequency of communication drops. So you just kind of recess and just kind of like oh, in a very kind of maybe uh, thoughtful manner. I'm going to consider this before I say anything. It's bad, you know, this is a bad stressful situation. Whereas in other cultures, you know, let's consider maybe um, Mediterranean, South, Southern Mediterranean culture, like maybe Italy. You know, the more stressed you get, the more effusive you get. Now imagine those two on a date and you have a stressful date situation anyways, right? An Italian, you know, uh, you're, you're generalized Italian and you're generalized, um, you know, a Southeast Asian uh, ty uh, type of, of behavior. If you have a stressful situation, one would recess. And as one's recessing, the stress response would be to become more effusive. And that's going to cause the other one to... So you can see how, um, you know, in the main... Um, you know, those are reliable generalizations about cultures um, there, um, you know, by uh, Streeter et al. Um, and many, many other people have, have studied that too as well. And you can see how that would cause problems, but it's encoded. It's, it's not something uh, that is, um, you know, uh, profoundly you know, visible. And it, uh, the intentionalist model is an alternative view uh, that successful communication entails exchange of communication intentions and that messages are simply the vehicle for which these exchanges are accomplished. Uh, consider the phrase, I love psychology. Used sincerely, it will be understood to mean one thing, that, that the same as the words, you love psychology. Used ironically, I love psychology. You can see that it, well, sorry about my acting. You can see that it would be understood to be something quite different. Uh, the assumption about the relation of words and meanings is reflected in the distinction between sentence meaning, literal meaning and word and phrase, the speaker meaning. So that's a very simple one, but the intention is what, what, what really is the vehicle that moves the words in the communication style. Um, perspective taking models, I'm going to throw this in there. He talks about that too as well. Perspective taking models assume that individuals experience the world from a different vantage point and that, that nature of each, it's the nature of each person's individual communication experiences that inform how they behave now. I've learned that if I do this, I need to encode this like that, uh, but it's nothing that we do um, uh, uh, consciously. This is kind of a subconscious behavioral type of mecha a mechanism that that arises through the development of schemata and habitus and experience um, and these kinds of things. 
Um, two other great people to read on this if you're interested in how people communicate are Herbert Mead, uh, talks about role play um, and that how children will actually learn through game stage and role play stage um, how and where to take perspective taking models, you know, and, 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 and how to use these things um, and what verbs, what cues, what types of behavioral stances and how you, all this kind of stuff. And then Piaget. Uh, Piaget was a um, educational uh, researcher, and um, he studied. Um, his main thing was the zone, zone of proximal, um, uh, the zone of proximity there, actual proximity. So, like, where do you, you know where's your physical space, and how does that interact with with teaching and learning and all that kind of stuff, and, and communicating as as well. Um, so those those are two Piaget and, and Herbert Mead, George Herbert Mead are two great people to read. Um, okay, so that's it. I am right at 10 minutes and 51 seconds. Um, cramming this in there as fast as I can. Um, but um, listen to the, the lecture a couple times. Um, and then um, the true false quiz that accompanies this is pretty easy um, if you've listened at all. <laughs> so um, I will see you guys next time. I believe the next uh, reading that I'm going to sample for you guys will be with regard to sexual in intimacy, which um, is always everybody's favorite topic. Um, um, and if you're interested in that, human sexuality is a, is a massively popular class at MJC. Um, so sexual intimacy will be our next topic. Um, till then, good luck on the quiz. Keep doing your work. And um, I'll talk to you guys later. My cats didn't even come in the room. That was cool. <laughs>